Uh, this is a, an area of uh, great uh, attention for me over the last couple of years. I primarily represent healthcare care providers, um, but have been counseling employers about the ACA uh, recently. Uh, and I will tell you that just from the perspective of keeping up with the regulatory uh, issuances, it's a, about a half-time job for me just to, uh, just to read those, uh, those uh, works of prose that uh, come out of Washington. Um, what, the, uh, what the ACA means for you right now, I think, is, is uh, three things. One is you, you probably already have experienced the uh, SBC uh, process. Those, those notices have been going out. My understanding is that a, a number of the notices, uh, the SBCs, are, uh, have errors on them, and so they need to be reviewed carefully to make sure that they are uh, accurate. Uh, the next thing that you need to do in the very near term is deal with the so-called FLSA notices that are supposed to be going out October 1st of this year that talk about uh, what the nature of your coverage that's being offered to your full-time employees is uh, and telling them uh, whether or not the uh, coverage is intended to be affordable for them. Those, those forms come in a couple different forms. You need to fill them out, uh, check the boxes, and, and get them out to the, to the employees. But I think more fundamentally, from a compliance perspective, what you need to be doing is, is taking a look at what your health coverage offerings are currently, even though we do get a bit of a holiday, if you will, in 2014 with respect to the, to the financial penalties, you need to, to make sure that you are offering uh, the coverage to at least 95% of your full-time employees and their dependents. You need to try to figure out to the best uh, ability that you have to figure out whether or not that coverage is going to be affordable for uh, your employees. Basically, self-only coverage uh, premium uh, exceeding 9.5 percent of the of the, uh, the employee's wages. You need to try to look at whether or not the coverage that you're offering meets the minimum value um, requirements, the 60 percent actuarial value. Um, and uh, because the penalty, when it does come to pass in 2015 can be triggered uh, by either the affordability, um, f falling below the affordability uh, threshold or uh, not uh, offering coverage that meets the, the minimum value requirement. Um, so I, I, I agree with Secretary Shore in the sense that we have a relatively uh, easy path ahead of us because we have been, have been living with um, health care reform here in Massachusetts for uh, quite a while. And we do have a high rate of uh, insurance coverage. Uh, but I think it, from, from the employer's perspective, uh, assuming that you are a uh, covered large employer, um, the uh, very short-term um, compliance issues are, are relatively limited. Now, and in everything that, that people talk about about the ACA, they need to, I think, put the caveat that we're talking about the rules as they are currently written. The, the chair responsibility payment delay was justified, if you will, by the fact that the, the federal government recognized that the reporting obligations on employers were very, very difficult. Uh, and they're going back and presumably rewriting some of those reporting obligations to make it easier to, to comply. So, Again, this is a moving target, uh, and you need to try to keep up as much as possible. And, and having forums like this and, and others uh, is, are, is going to be very important in the next year or two years, really, so to enable you to keep up with the ever-changing regulatory environment. It's, it's not going to stop now. It's going to continue to evolve. Um, and you know, we can get in a, later, a little later into the question of you know, should I or should I not even care about the ACA depending upon the size of, in, of my company? And, and we can talk about how do you uh, play the pay or play game under the ACA and, and how do you count to 50 at, at some point later. But that's, obviously that is a, a threshold question that needs to be answered as well. Thank you, Peter. Our next uh, speaker is going to be Jean Yang. She's the Executive Director of the Commonwealth Health Insurance Connector Authority. Jean. Hello. It's working. Um, 
Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Jean Yang. I'm uh, the executive director of the Health Connector, and I'm relatively new the, to this role, I'm succeeding Secretary Shore about six months ago. I have been with the organization for about three years. I'm previously serving as its chief financial officer, and prior to that, I was uh, working at Tufts Health Plan, so I have a private sector um, background. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit about the Health Connector and what we do and we are doing to implement the changes. Uh, a lot of that was already in, uh, embedded in Secretary Shore's remarks, so I believe uh, they're somewhat familiar to you. In a, in, a, in a nutshell, what we do is we provide a marketplace uh, that facilitate the access to private insurance products by individuals and small businesses. So we serve both individuals, non-group members, and also small businesses who purchase insurance through the merge market. Um, and uh, I would say that our mission um, is to not only make what was not available previously available, but also make the marketplace look more like a marketplace um, so that we promote transparency, to promote competition, so that over time the market becomes more competitive and, and more affordable. Um, so um, in terms of the way we interact with the, the market and the people that we serve, I, I think about two aspects. One is that um, the market um, certain certain segments of the market are our customers. We directly serve them um, and provide access um, to health insurance, help them pro, uh, access health insurance, and also we, we serve a policy-making role. So we work closely with the administration and the legislature um, when it comes to um, making certain decisions in terms of how the state would be um, implementing certain aspects of the reform and aligning with the Affordable Care Act. So when it comes to the Affordable Care Act, there are major implications on both these fronts. Um, so in terms of what we offer as a marketplace, um, first of all, this is a, an opportunity for us to take a fresh look at our offering, what we provide and how we're providing them, um, and then to improve uh, what we do and, and make them more appealing to the market. So as Secretary Shore mentioned that uh, we are introducing a, a major um, sort of update to our product portfolio, introducing new options and then for example for the first time in 2014 we will be offering dental insurance um, to the individuals and small businesses and this is an area that we think uh, better access actually uh, can add a lot of value to the market so we're very excited about that um, and um, I would like to sort of um, mention a couple of uh, a few specific things that are sort of um, ushered in also by the Affordable Care Act. Some of them are directly the result of the law and some of them are just things that we're introducing or have already started to introduce uh, by way of implementing some of the changes. Uh, the first uh, to mention is the small business tax credit. This is the federal tax credit. The tax credit has actually has been available um, since 2010 uh, throughout the market, but starting in 2014, uh, the tax credit is only going to be available um, to eligible small employers purchasing through the exchange. Um, a lot of people know that, but there are some. Uh, there is one more point: is that actually in 2014 the tax credit is going to be higher. So, uh, so it's it's a more significant benefit. This is for um, a small at a, at a high level. Again, lots of details that you can find, but including in the in a very nicely done um, packet that provided by uh, Fallon Community Health Plan. Uh, this is for um, small employers uh, with up to 25 FTEs with low income, um, low wage workers. Um, so this is a great incentive for small businesses to offer insurance to their employees. Um, another sort of a, sort of a broad, more broad um, new benefit, if you will, of the Affordable Care Act is the, is the expanded flexibility um, in terms of um, access to insurance by individuals. Um, so it's not only um, individuals with subsidy and also individuals without subsidy. There is just more freedom in terms of their purchasing health insurance um, through the marketplace or or elsewhere. Um, our um, uh, we understand a lot of 
of the individual members that we serve are employed. Most of them are employed. So the fact that there is more flexibility in the individual's access and insurance is actually a great benefit to the employers um, because this is, uh, give them peace of mind, um, makes their life easier. Um, uh, the third uh, is a little bit of a technical um, thing that we are very excited about, but I, I'm sure that uh, employers, small employers who are not familiar with them um, today, they will find them appealing is what we call an innovative um, sort of um, in, health insurance product offering mechanism, what we call employee choice. Um, so the idea is that um, because employers sometimes have to make um, decisions on which health plan uh, to choose that will fit the needs of all the employees and their, their dependents. And sometimes it's really a, a wrestle to pick that plan because different employees have different preferences on different needs. Um, and uh, what we are going to make it uh, available, make available to employees that you can come in um, to the exchange and that you are able to select a benchmark plan, but it's almost as, as if the employee can actually swap for a different plan. Uh, so the idea is very simple. Uh, the challenge is administratively in the small group market is very, very difficult to effectuate that, but the exchange is, is able to do that um, in a very efficient manner. So uh, during the course of 2014, we'll be introducing that mechanism, um, and, uh, and then, uh, so there will be a new benefit. The last thing that I want to mention in terms of the new offering, uh, it's actually not brand new, but it was uh, introduced a couple of years ago uh, um, uh, enacted by Chapter 288, um, and it was re-platformed um, um, in this past year, is the Health, in, uh, Health Connector Small Business Wellness Discount Program. There is a very strong recognition by the market that there needs to be a mechanism um, for us collectively to invest in small business wellness. It's an area of challenge because this is a population that is not as stable as large employer, so it's difficult to, to sort of secure and, and stabilize a mechanism where there is um, investment in terms of um, employer and employees um, sort of uh, commitment towards wellness um, activities and then because this is a long-term investment you have to make sure there is a commitment so that the benefit will play out over time and then what the health connector is doing is for uh, small businesses that purchase insurance through us you are eligible potentially on following a set of criteria um, that to, to eligible for 15% um, rebate uh, for the employer health insurance charge uh, Spending. Uh, again, this is an incentive. This is obviously a, sort of a, a, a relief, but, the, but the, uh, the intent is not the premium relief. The intent is for employers to really um, invest and help, well, we're helping you make the investment to, um, to adopt wellness initiatives because we think this is longer term, this is the right thing for, uh, for the workers and for the population. Um, let me just also quickly talk about a, a couple of new things that, that we're doing, not new things, but things we're doing um, on, the, on the policy making side, the role of the health connector. Two things. Uh, one of the, the, uh, the roles that we play is um, we administer the state um, small and non-group market with risk adjustment program. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but risk adjustment essentially is, is, a, is a premium redistribution behind the scene, if you will, among the health insurance carriers. So what that means is that health insurance uh, companies will not price a book of business based on the population that actually deserve, uh, directly serves. It's going to be priced based on the entire market. So that if your population is healthier, then you will have to pay into a risk adjustment pool. If your population is sicker, then you will get a reward um, from the pool so that you can price, you won't have to price higher for the sicker population. So this is one of the things that um, it is part of the broader package that is going to introduce some pretty significant change to premium pricing, uh, a little bit in conjunction with the rating factor changes. Um, but at the same time, risk adjustment in the longer term stabilizes premium. There's a lot of empirical evidence around that. Um, so this is a requirement of federal law. Um, the Massachusetts is the only state 
um, to this date has secured a, an option to provide its own risk adjustment program. And we chose this path because we believe um, there is a way to do this better in a more streamlined fashion and performs better from a premium stabilization perspective. Uh, last, last point I wanted to make is that we have also um, served a policy uh, role trying to reconcile uh, the ACA and the Massachusetts law. A lot of policy decisions that were made um, by the administration uh, we were uh, working very closely on that, such as the minimum credible coverage, individual mandate. And then we wanted to be a resource um, to the employer market. Um, and then there is a lot of changes coming down the pipe. And uh, we wanted to be there for you, answering questions and providing the necessary support. Um, that includes some of the road shows that Secretary Shore mentioned, but certainly on an ongoing basis as well. I just wanted to emphasize that. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Our next uh, speaker opening statement is, is Patrick Farrell. He's the Regulatory Affairs Director at Fallon Community Health Plan. Patrick. Thank you, Bill. Um, good morning. I want to thank everyone for, uh, for coming out this morning for the, to the forum, um, and uh, thank Mr. Business Journal for having me on the panel. Um, in terms of what I'd like to talk about for, for my opening here, I, I thought I'd talk a little bit about what insurance companies have been doing, Fallon and, and our competitors, uh, to prepare for the uh, ACA items that are coming in 2014. Uh, a lot of these items have been touched on by the previous speakers. I'm sure uh, some of them are going to come up uh, later in the panel discussion as well. Uh, if you look at um, all the ACA items that we're working on, I, I think a lot of them are working on or following. They, they tend to fall into uh, probably about, about three major buckets. Uh, the biggest one is probably merge market changes, which I think is no surprise, um, you know, given some of the items we've heard from previous speakers. Uh, there's a great deal that's changing in that market in terms of which products are available uh, and how they're rated. Um, Really, if you're, you're buying something in that market now, as we move into 2014, you really need to, to look at uh, you know, what's out there in, in terms of your options. Uh, there were rules around uh, becoming a qualified health plan to sell through the connector. Uh, so uh, I think uh, FCHP and other insurers have really been uh, expending a lot of energy on get, getting all that lined up, getting that set up. As Glenn had said earlier, uh, all the insurers had to do their uh, rate and product filings with the Division of Insurance for July 1st. Uh, we're still waiting to, uh, for that, that process to, uh, to wind its way through. Uh, but in the not too distant future, uh, things will become clearer, I think, in terms of what everyone will be offering in 14, how the rates will fall on those, uh, and the products for January 1st will start going on sale uh, as of October 1st. Uh, a second uh, major uh, category that we're following, uh, which Peter had talked about in his remarks, is these employer requirements. Um, I'll, I'll use the term employer requirements, but some of them are, are probably going to involve uh, support from insurers to, to varying degrees. Uh, the big one is obviously the employer shared responsibility piece. Uh, I think it, it's good that the federal regulators have pushed that back a year. Uh, it doesn't so much give us, uh, you know, an extra year to just sit back and not worry about it as much as it probably gives adequate time to, to figure it out. I, I think that a lot of people, uh, both I think employers and insurers, were, um, you know, really uh, trying to get their hands around that in terms of what does it mean. There's a lot of different options, a lot of different directions uh, an employer can go in depending on their specific circumstances. Uh, and we'll, uh, I think we'll all need that additional time to, to really uh, come to grips with that and then figure out how to proceed on that. Uh, there's also the uh, notice of coverage options uh, for employers who are subject to the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, which Peter also mentioned. Uh, there were some recent regulations that came out about waiting periods. Uh, there's also a number of other requirements that are out there in the ACA where we just haven't really gotten any guidance on them yet, but they're probably coming at some point. Uh, so definitely some other things of this nature to, uh, to watch for, to keep an eye on. Uh, a third major category of, of ACA items that I'd mentioned, which seemed like it was a hot topic for a while, and, and uh, maybe uh, at this point things have kind of fallen into place and maybe not as much, are the different uh, taxes, fees, and assessments uh, that are placed on by the ACA. Uh, all of those uh, you know, are going to find their way into, into rates in 2014. Uh, if you have a, a fully insured plan, uh, your insurer will pay them, but again, it will, they will find their way into your rates. Uh, if you're self-funded, um, some apply, some don't. Uh, you may end up actually seeing a, a, a bill for the specific amount that's, that's attributable to your business. But uh, that's something that I think it's important to understand also how that impacts things moving into 2014. Uh, there's, although those are probably the three big buckets, there are certainly also some um, ACA items that don't fall into those three. Uh, one item that seems to be getting a little bit of attention lately, a little bit of buzz, is the uh, requirement in the ACA around out-of-pocket maximums, uh, which is going to roll in as, as plans renew in 2014. Uh, and of course, from some of the earlier discussion, uh, there was mention of Chapter 224, uh, the latest in our series of uh, state health care reform bills. Uh, I think a lot of um, 
a lot of what's going on in 224, a lot of kind of the, the big items there around, for example, the Health Policy Commission and, and managing the uh, to cost uh, growth goals. You know, at this point are, are still things that are more to come um, that haven't quite quite trickled down to this level yet. Uh, but there, there certainly, uh, you know, are pieces there to keep an eye on. There are some concrete pieces that insurers are working on. Uh, the transparency piece, which I think has gotten a, a little bit of attention, is one that comes to mind. So. Um, uh, Fallon and other insurers in Massachusetts have, uh, you know, we've been busy on all, with all these things over the past several months. We'll continue to be busy with them at least for the, uh, the next several months. Um, but I, I think, you know, as we move forward, obviously, uh, what's going to be available in uh, 2014 is going to be becoming clearer uh, in the not, sometime in the not too distant future. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Pat. Uh, a final opening statement will be made by Jack Myers. He's the Vice President of Benefit. Uh, consultant benefit development group and uh, I'm sure you want to hear all the Jack has all the answers as to how to, how to thanks, escape Bill. all of this. Thanks, thanks for setting, <laughs> for setting the table for me. Uh, my, my, uh, my name is Jack Myers and I'm with Benefit Development Group. We're a benefit brokerage and consulting firm uh, headquartered here in Worcester, Massachusetts and uh, we're very happy to be here this morning to talk to you about the impacts of Healthcare reform, and I, I think as you listen to the panelists and as you listen to Secretary Shore in a time of great change, and as a consultant and advisor to uh, many employers, some in the room uh, and, and across New England, it's critical to stay out in front of the fast-moving post-reform market, making crisp, informed decisions so that you ensure the success of your business and uh, keeping an eye on the fundamentals, keeping the eye on compliance, ensuring that your Section 125 documents are updated and in place as an employer, that your summary plan description documents are accurate, updated, and distributed, making sure that you're filing your 5500. These fundamental uh, business practices need to remain in place. There is a strong market watch right now on pricing because so much is fluid and in flux. And uh, looking at product opportunities and pricing associated with those products as we had into 2014, is critically important, working closely with your advisor and uh, others that help you make purchasing decisions so that you're optimizing health care reform, that you're making sure that all of the new products, uh, and in particular, defined contribution approaches. If you haven't explored defined contribution in a more formal way, I think Gene alluded to that and what the connector is doing, but that type of approach is available to you um, through the uh, market outside of the exchange. And there's advancing technology that gives employers an opportunity to customize a very unique purchasing experience that leverages defined contribution in that same type of Expedia web-enabled environment where you can structure an allocated amount of money toward your total benefits and allow your employees to go in and become empowered to purchase benefits, medical, dental, life, and disability, and a defined contribution approach, and have that technology, that, ex that private exchange, if you will, plugged back into the employers for an end-to-end -end suite. And that, that technology's coming. Uh, some carriers have it in the marketplace today. So I, I guess we are in, a, in an unprecedented time of change as it relates to benefits. And, uh, as it relates to staying on top of that and ensuring that you're optimizing the situation. I think that's our job as advisors and as brokers in the community. So uh, I look forward to the balance of the panel discussion. And Bill, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Jack. Thank you.